All right, it's great to be with you this morning as we worship God here in the lower auditorium or the basement, as uh, I've called it for many years. Um, this morning, as we come together, if you don't know, we're, we're jumping back into the Gospel of Luke. We're going to continue that trek all the way till Christmas. Christmas, we'll pause to do an Advent series and then come back in the new year. We'll jump back into the Gospel of Luke because we want to learn what it means to follow Jesus through his words. And so it's, it's been a slow trek, but it's been a good trek because we don't want to just think and say, I think this is what Jesus was teaching, but not actually know it. And so as we walk through the gospel of Luke, he is going to teach us his words time and time again. And sometimes we're going to repeat ourselves with things that we've already learned in the past. But like we say, whenever we repeat any truth that Jesus taught, um, it's okay because Jesus sometimes taught his disciples the same things over and over and over again so that it would sink into their head, their hearts, and change the way that they live. And so this morning, we're, we're going to take a small challenge from Jesus and simply do not worry. Do not worry. And I, I, I know right now, it seems like there's a lot that we can worry about. And I'm sure if I asked you, what are your worries, what keeps you awake at night, you might have a lot of things that you'd say, this are my worries, this is what keeps me awake at night. And, and I'm not going to let you shout them out today, but in our ever-changing world, as we know, uh, a week ago, just over a week ago, war broke out in Israel. We still have war going on in the Ukraine. We still have war in parts of Africa. We live in a country where we have a drug pandemic. We live in a place where there is a lot of chaos all around us. And so I think for many of us, there, there are many things that we can worry about. And this morning, we're going to say, okay, Jesus, show us what it means not to worry. Show us what it means that, that God, you are in control. And as I was preparing for today, I, I was reading a few different articles or this last week about the effects of anxiety and worry in our culture and as I was reading this one article that came out pre-pandemic, and I know the numbers have gone up since the pandemic, but it was saying that one in five people here in Canada are affected from some kind of mental health or mental mood disorder because of worry and anxiety. And they don't know where to turn, and so in Canada we turn to things like substances to help us overcome and according to this study pre-2020, it said that Canadians would use 12, spend $12 billion a year on tobacco to kind of, kind of ease some of the pain, take away some of the stress. $14.6 billion on alcohol, $2.8 to $4.5 billion on cannabis, and then of course $3.5 billion on opioids. You see, we live in a world that, that, that is struggling with stress struggling with anxiety, struggling with fear. And so the question is, as followers of Jesus, what do we do? Do we bury our heads in the sand and do nothing? Or do we say, all right, Jesus, how do you want me to be your hands and feet in this world? How do you want me to share your love in this world? Because after all, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I remember a few years ago, Robert Griffin Jr., I believe that's who it was, he was sitting at a press conference in the NFL, and he was wearing this shirt that is so true that said, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. He actually was told by the NFL that he had to turn his shirt inside out because it was offensive, but it is so true. And this morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, I, I want to say this to you. You need to know Jesus to find peace. You need to know Jesus so that what we talk about here today can be real for you because Jesus is actually going to talk to his disciples again. He's going to talk to those that know him as Lord, that are following him, that are learning from him. Yes, there are crowds around as he is speaking, as he is teaching, but he is addressing the disciples here today. And so if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you know him as Savior and Lord, he is speaking to you. If you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, I want to challenge you to make things right, to confess your sin, repent, turn to him, Establish that right relationship that was broken by sin. Receive what Jesus did on the cross and when he rose again and, and be his followers. Declare him as Lord. Allow him to speak into your life. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at a story found in Luke 12, 22 to 34. 
It is also found in Matthew 6, 25 to 33 as a cross-reference. And Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is going to teach the twelve what it means to not worry. And, not to, and what it means not to worry about the small things. And so if you have your Bibles, we'll go to Luke. Luke 12, 22 to 24. And the Word of God says this. He says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about, about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. Consider the raven. They do not sow or reap. They do not have a storeroom or a barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you, since you cannot do such... This, <laughs> Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how much God has clothed the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your hearts on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagans, for the pagan world runs after such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, and treasures in heaven that will not be exhausted where no thief will come near and no moths will destroy. For where your treasure is, their heart will be also. Let me pray. Father God, that is your word here this morning. And I pray that as your word goes out, Lord, that it will not come back void or empty. I pray that as your word goes out, if I miss speaking something today that someone really needs to hear from that passage, I pray that your word will reveal that to them and show them, you know what, this is what, this is what I'm saying to you as my follower. And so, God, I pray like I always do. Help me to remember what you want me to remember. Help me to forget what you want me to forget. And, God, I pray that this morning will be a challenge to all of us, and it won't just be head knowledge, heart knowledge, but it'll transform the way that we live as your spirit works in our lives. Lead our time here this morning, or continue to lead our time here this morning as you already have. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So we're continuing on in chapter 12. At the start of chapter 12, Jesus addresses the disciples. He goes to the crowds. He addresses the crowds about covetous, about greed, in the parable of the rich young fool. And then he comes back to worry. Um, a, a German theologian named Johann Arndt, he says it like this. He says, greed can never get enough. Worry is afraid that we may not have enough. And that's why Jesus is talking about both these things back to back. He just finished addressing the crowds and his disciples were there to hear it as well and they were like, okay, you know what? We can't be greedy like the rest of the world and now he's saying, no, no, no. I don't want you to just be greed, not be greedy. I also don't want you to worry. And so this morning as, we, as we've gone through the Gospel of Luke, we've asked ourselves this question many times and we'll ask it again. What does Luke want most excellent Theophilus? What does he want the people of the day and what does he want us to know by inserting this into his Gospel story? And I believe that this morning Jesus wants his disciples to know, he wants us to know, right, simply do not worry or focus solely on the physical needs. I know it seems very easy to say that because it says do not worry at least above my section here in scripture. And so you're like, well, Darren, of course he means that. But, but I want you to know as, as Jesus is about to teach us not to worry about clothes and about food and about the physical. I want you to be very clear, even though you could probably try to make a case for it in verse 33, Jesus is not preaching a poverty gospel here. He's not saying to his followers, I want you to be poor and penniless. He's also not saying to his followers, if you follow me, you're going to be healthy and wealthy and nothing's going to go wrong for you, because neither of those are the gospel. Jesus is coming along and he's saying, whether you're rich or you're poor, I don't want you to be worried. To his disciples that are sitting there listening to him, whether you're rich in the eyes of the world or you're poor in the eyes of the world, I don't want you to be worried. 
And actually, when we, when, we, when we go through this part of Scripture, Jesus actually forbids us as disciples to worry about the physical needs. The physical needs of food and clothes. Actually, if you, if you just quickly went through there, you would see that, that Jesus doesn't just suggest saying, don't worry. He says, no, do not worry in verse 22. In verse 29, he says, don't let your, sets, don't let your heart be set on what you will eat, what you will wear. He comes back in verse 29 and says, do not worry again. And then he says in verse 32, as he addresses his group of small disciples, he says, don't be afraid. And so he's commanding us not to worry, but I don't know about you, but there's some, sometimes in my life, I, the worries creep in. So, so what, what do you need to do? What do I need to do so that we can push those away and we can understand what Jesus is saying to us here today? And so I'm going to give us three things that I believe Jesus is saying to his disciples here about how we can push the worry away, how we can understand what, what he is saying to them back then and it's still relevant to us today, is that, that God, our Father in heaven, is going to provide. Well, you might say, well, how is he going to provide? In verse 22 and 23, he says this, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, and about what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothes. So the first way that we can eliminate worry about the physical, about the food, about the clothes, is, is understand the truth that Jesus said there. Did you guys catch the truth that Jesus said there? Life is more than food or clothes. Church, I need you to know this morning, if you want to eliminate worry from your life, we need to understand that life is bigger than food and clothes. There's a higher calling, there's a higher goal there's more to life than just eating and drinking and having good clothes. I know it's hard for us to understand this in the West, right? We, we like our designer brands. I wouldn't say in this group, but, but again, I'm not saying that as a bad thing. <laughs> We're going downhill quick. Maybe, maybe, maybe you guys have closets full of Gucci and Dior and Louis Vuitton and you don't wear them on Sunday mornings, but I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. If you actually follow social media, right, this, this wanting to fit in, to have the greatest clothes has, has creeped into the church. All you have to look at is an Instagram account called Preachers and Sneakers. And they take pictures of these pastors that have amazing shoes that cost hundreds and thousands of dollars. Or they have their Louis Vuitton bag or their Dior uh, hat. I don't know. But, but it's hard for us sometimes to believe that, that life is more than clothes because it seems like the rest of the world has them. Also, in the West, it's hard for us to believe that, that life is bigger than food because who doesn't like to eat out, right? I love going to the States because I get to go to the Cheesecake Factory. I love the Cheesecake Factory. And so sometimes we are motivated by our food, by our clothes, but, but, but Jesus wants us to know this truth. There's something greater. There's something greater. And, and I think we all know that. Because as a group many years ago, when we sat down to talk about the vision of River of Life Church, it wasn't like, let's just get together and eat food. Let's get together on Sundays, drink some coffee, have a few free lattes, have some snacks, and, and that's what we're about. Anybody can come, anybody can eat, anybody can hang out. No, we know that life is more than just food and clothes. And Jesus says, if you don't want to worry, know that. Know that. And so I'm going to ask you, why do we exist here at River of Life Church? Do you know how, why we exist? I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you, okay? We are here to help people experience full life as Jesus Christ intended. Yes, we want to continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus, right? In, in Matthew 25, when, when Jesus is talking about the sheep and the, and the goats, and he says, you, you fed me when, when I was hungry. You gave me something to drink. You invited me in. We want to continue to do that, but we want to do that because we want to help people experience full life as Jesus Christ intended, Life is greater than just eating and what we have to wear. We have to remember that. And if we have our eyes on the fact that life is greater than these things, it can change our worry. It can change our worry about what we are going to wear, how we're going to purchase this next thing or the thing after that. And so this morning, I want to ask you, do you believe that, that, that life, is worth, life is bigger than just food and clothes? Because if you do, it'll change things. The second thing he tells us here in this passage is he tells us that if we want to not worry about our physical needs is that we can understand that, that God will provide. God has provided for his creation and he'll continue to provide for us. 
We see that in verse 24, 27, and 28. He starts out simply saying how he provides food for, first and foremost, the ravens. He says, consider the ravens. They do not reap. They do not have storerooms or barns, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? Earlier on, he, he says the same thing to the 12, right? You're more valuable than sparrows. And we said back in that sermon that, that sometimes when you bought a sparrow, you got a free sparrow. So you're, you're more valuable than the free sparrow. Like God loves you so much that he wants to provide for your daily needs. And so he comes along and says, are you not more valuable than the raven? You see, for the 12 that are sitting there, they'd be like, okay, a raven, really? Jesus, a raven? Raven's one of those unclean birds according to the Levitical law. Like, you actually care for the raven? Yeah. I know this isn't news to you guys because you do grow up in Greendale, so you understand a little bit of agriculture, and you also understand life in general, but ravens aren't like humans. They're not. Believe it or not, I know, mind-blowing. I should be a science teacher. I understand that. But, like, they don't go out and they don't plant a field. They don't water it. They don't harvest it. They don't bring it back to their storeroom and, and build up all this stuff so that they can either sell the grain to make money or take the grain and make bread. I know, I know this is mind-blowing information here this morning, but they don't do that. But what do they do? God provides for them. God provides the food that they need each and every day. Are you not more important than ravens? To God you are. You are his child. You're made in his image and his likeness, and as a disciple, as a follower of his, he will continue to provide for you. And then he continues on, and he says, not only the ravens are provided food. Do you know how I clothe the lilies of the field? He says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how much God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Again, another agricultural reference. How many of you here think flowers are beautiful? All right, a handful of you. Some of you are like, no, just garbage, just garbage. <laughs> garbage growing in the field. Who cares, Darren? Who cares? I got you. Okay, but, but let's be honest. There's something beautiful about flowers. Wildflowers are amazing. Guys, I'm just letting you know, if you bring your wife home flowers today or your fiance or your girlfriend, they're going to love them because to them, flowers are beautiful, right? And, and so... If you're here today and you think flowers are beautiful, what do they do to grow? Nothing. Nothing. And, and their beauty, when you look upon them, Jesus says it's more beautiful than Solomon in all of his splendor. Do you guys know who Solomon is? King in the Old Testament? You can read about him in the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings, the first nine chapters of 2 Chronicles. And he says to his followers who would know who Solomon is, Good Jewish boys, they know who their kings were. He says to them, the lilies of the flare, field, they have more splendor than, than Solomon in all of his splendor. I just want you to think about that for a moment. I know for us it doesn't mean a whole lot because we're like, uh, you know what, Solomon, was he really that amazing? Yeah, no, he was. He, he was the richest, most magnificent king of Israel whose grandeur, whose glory was bigger than any of the kings of the day. And they're not just saying, you know what, he is looking good as he wears his sweatpants around the kingdom, right? He's not saying like that. They're saying he's dressed in his royal garb. He has the nicest clothes on that you can ever think of. And if you want to go to Gucci or Louis Vuitton, you can. I don't even know those brands, but I, I know they are brands. Right? And then he's taking the king crown that they put on King Charles, they put it on his head, and he's standing there in his splendor, and guess what? Flowers. Flowers. Flowers are, are clothed by who? By, by God. The splendor of the lilies that grow. Church, church, I need you to let that sink in for a moment. You know what? God cares for his creation. He clothes them. And then, depending on how you read this passage, you might also say, well, the grass of the field, it, it, it grows. Right? Who here likes to mow grass? It's October 15th. We're still mowing grass. Like, it's like, what's going on? Like, it's October 15th. And no more grass. No more grass. But, but let's be honest. What does grass need to grow? 
I know some of us think it's us, right? Some of us think it's like, oh, it's me. We've had some hot summers, and so in those summers, we got to water our grass because otherwise it won't come back. Guess what? In those hot summers, I never watered my grass. It was dead, dead, dead. <laughs> Guess what? I'm mowing it like every four or five days right now. Like grass does nothing. Yet, yet God causes it to grow. He takes care of it. Church, does God take care of his creation? When you think to the Old Testament, the Israelites in the desert, how did they eat? What did they eat? Manna and quail. Where did it come from? God. Elijah, when he's running for his life, hanging out. Who comes and feeds him? Raven sent by. And he gets meat and bread. So here's the thing we need to know. Just as God takes care of his creation, he will take care of those that love him and follow him. If you are a disciple and you are following Jesus each and every day, we don't need to worry about our physical needs because God will provide. Jesus goes on and he says this next one and he says, he says, you don't want to focus or worry about the physical needs? Understand that your worrying has no power over anything. Right? Worry does no good. He says it like this, who of you by worry can add a single hour to your life? Okay, just think about that. You can worry... I'm going to extend my life. I'm going to extend my life. You can't do that, but what does Jesus say there? Like, he's, tell us what you really think, Jesus. Since you cannot do this very little thing, I think it's a pretty big thing. Like, if I could add time to my life, you can do this very little thing. Why worry about the rest? That's how big our God is. That's how much he is in control. Right? We, when we read this, we need to understand God is taking care of all of his creations, so he wants to take care of those that will say, yes, I want to be a child of God. Yes, I want to follow you. Yes, I want to be your disciple. And so he's teaching the 12 that there's going to be tough times coming. There's going to be seasons of plenty and seasons that are hard, but, but he's going to continue to provide for them. Church, as we read this, it was interesting as I was reading it, it was like, you know what, adding a single hour to my life is, is pretty amazing. But, but as you read it, you also got to understand the original audience could have taken it a different way. And if you have your little U version Bibles, just so I'm not lying to you, if you open them up and you go into Luke chapter 12, some translations will say it like this, but right now I have the NIV open. It says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? But if you click on that little question box there, you click on it and it pops open and it tells you, who of you by worrying could add a single cubit to your height. Like, either one of them is not out of the ordinary, but a lot of theologians say, well, it might make more sense because he's talking about flowers growing, and so his disciples are like, man, can I add a cubit of a height to, height to myself? And I know for many of you here, you're like, I don't want a cubit of height, or I don't know what a cubit of height is. It's 18 inches, so it's, it's a pretty big measure. I know for myself, maybe I might want 18 inches, but for Jesus' day, that'd be huge too, Right? The average person in Jesus' day was like five foot nothing to five two. And so they're like, man, I eat 18 inches. Like, I, I'm still smaller than Shaq, but I could be tall like King Solomon, right? So, but Jesus is saying, this is a very little thing for God to do. To give his creation height, to give his creation life, to clothe and feed his creation. And so he's telling us here today that, that we don't need to worry. And so I want to ask you this morning, do you, do you believe that God will provide for our daily needs, not our daily greeds? He'll provide your food, he'll provide your clothes, he'll provide all that you need. Do you believe that? Do you see God as a provider, as a good father that will take care of his children? I know for myself, I actually started jotting notes for this, which is going to be mind-blowing because it's like, I haven't worked on it a lot since then, on September 18th. I started jotting notes, and I, I, was, I was saying to God as I was reading this, and it's like, okay, don't worry, very easy to say, sometimes hard to do. And then I was like, God, I have lots of friends that have those crazy stories that, like, you know, one day I could not pay my rent, and all of a sudden, someone shows up with the rent check and says, here you go, takes care of it. God, I can't, I, I, I need new tires. Someone shows up and gives me new tires. I'm like, God, do I have any crazy stories like that? And I was thinking, and I was thinking about ways that God provided for me and Alyssa early on in our marriage, and I was thinking about a few other things. And I was like, God, do you provide like that? And it just so happened on that day when I asked God that question, there was a couple from our church that showed up here, and they dropped me off a bunch of produce and a bunch of jars of pickles and jams and stuff like that. And they're like, this is for you and your family. And I was like, 
I was, I was kind of smiling inside, and I was like, God, does that really count? Because technically, technically, this is me now, technically, we talked to them earlier in the week, and they said they were going to drop past sometime and give me produce. And then I went home that day, and Bryce was going to come over with, with windows for church decor. He's like, do you want them? And we're like, well, take them for now. We might use them upstairs. We might not. And so I was waiting for him to show up because we we're going to put them in my shop. And all of a sudden, I got a knock at the door. And I thought it was Bryce, so I ran out to the garage, and I opened up the door, and it's not Bryce standing there. It's a person I haven't seen in two years, and they're like, hey, I'm just dropping you off some bread and some cereal and some baking, and yeah, have a good day. And God was just looking at me. <laughs> I felt like God was just saying to me, Darren, Darren, this is the way that I provide. This is the way that I provide. And I am sure each one of us, as, as followers of Jesus, as we, as we follow him, as we love him, as we call out to him daily, we have stories where we're... God just shows up and he provides. And I think that's one thing. Like when we come to sharing Sundays, we need to remember what God's doing in our lives so that we can share what God, what God is actually doing. And so this morning, this morning, I want you to know, do we want to eliminate worry? Do we want to eliminate focusing on the physical? We need to understand three things. We need to understand that, that life is more than just food and clothes. We need to understand that God cares for his creation and that worrying doesn't do a single thing. We can't, in our own power, add an hour to our life. We can't add 18 inches, even though I wish I could. I wouldn't play in the NBA because I'd still be too short. But, you know, again, worry doesn't do anything. Jesus goes on, and he says, you know what changes your life? You know what makes worry go away? And so we say, what, what does Luke want most excellent Theophilus? What does he want the people of the day to know by inserting this into his gospel? And I think it's instead of worrying and focusing your attention on the physical, Focus on the kingdom of God both now and to come. Instead of worrying about my food, what my next meal is going to be, or what I'm going to wear, focus in on the kingdom of God. Jesus says it like this in verses 31 through 34. He says, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide for purses for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Church, this morning, I want to ask you. Is Jesus your greatest treasure? Jesus is teaching his 12 here that are following him. He's teaching the disciples that, that, that they need to seek the kingdom of God. And as he's been teaching over the last 12 chapters, and he'll continue to teach until we finish up the book of Luke and he goes to the cross and rises again, he is teaching this upside-down kingdom. He's teaching what the kingdom of God looks like lived out. And for the 12 here... And for his disciples, he, they're sitting there saying, we're getting this because we're hearing the teaching over and over and over again. The people in the crowd are missing it. But Jesus is reiterating things that he's already taught. Will you, will you, my disciples, will you seek me? Will you follow me? Will you obey me? Will you give your life for me? Will you know that I will provide for you? You see, the greatest treasure that this world can have is Jesus. The greatest treasure that we can have is Jesus. He's greater than anything this world has to offer. And I want to ask you, do, do we believe that? What would happen in our lives if we, if we chose to focus in on his kingdom? What would happen in our lives if we chose each and every day to give him our time, our talents, our treasures? What would change in your life if he was your everything? Norval Glendenhouse, a German theologian, and I really like his commentary on the book of Luke, he says it like this when it comes to our hearts for following God, for seeking his kingdom. He says, with regards to the material needs of the faithful, to God will give them what they require in the way that is most beneficial to them. But they must love him, they must trust in him and obey him. It must be the main object and the passion of their lives to seek above all the kingdom of heaven to endeavor to serve God and to be guided and ruled by him so that they might share in the benefits of his kingdom, in the blessings accomplished by his kingly sovereignty. Church, I want to ask you, 
Do you trust Jesus the good shepherd? Do you believe that the Lord is your shepherd and he will walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death? Do you believe that, that Jesus will take care of his sheep because he is the good shepherd? Do you trust him? And if we trust him and we seek him each and every day and we seek his kingdom both now and to come as we pray, come Lord Jesus, come, instead of worrying, instead of worrying, let's continue to seek after him. He says this, he says to the 12, he says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I know when we read that, we start to think to ourselves, well, Jesus, you must mean I need to be poor and penniless. No, no, no. What Jesus is saying to his disciples in code, he's saying, I want you to be sold out for me. I want you to give your everything to me. I want me to be your treasure. And as I am your treasure, you're going to treasure the things that I treasure, and that's the people around you, and you're going to continue to pour yourself out into them. He's not saying be poor and penniless. He's saying, let me be your everything. He's reiterating what he said in Luke 9, 23 to 25, where he says, if you want to be my followers, come after me, deny yourself daily, take up your cross and follow He's calling them to be sold out just like he's calling us to be sold out. And so I want to ask you this morning, who is Lord of your life? Is Jesus Lord of your life? Are you saying Jesus is Lord? If he is Lord of your life, he is the one that is in control of your time, your talents, and your treasures. You see, here's the thing about authority, whether we believe it or not, there's two types of authority in this world. There's external authority and internal authority, right? When, when it comes to most of the world, we want to live by internal authority. We want to say, I get to say what's right and wrong. I get to say what's good and evil. I think this is right. I think this is good. I think that I can do this. But when we say Jesus is Lord, we're saying, Jesus, you get to say what is right and wrong. You get to say what is good and evil. You get to say how I should live my life and to your followers, you're saying, come, seek my kingdom now and forever. And that's what he's saying to us today. He's saying, come and seek my kingdom now and forever. Do you know how we can push away worry and anxiety about the daily needs? Is we say, today, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Today, Jesus, you, this is your day. What, what do you want me to do? Yes, we need to go to work. Yes, there's things that need to get done. But, but when our focus is on Jesus, it changes how we interact with problems that come up. It changes how we interact with maybe some minor changes throughout our day that we're like, oh, I wasn't planning on talking on the phone for 45 minutes, but I am now because that person phoned me and they, they needed to hear that I love them and that God loved them. So I want to ask you, who is Lord of your life? Do you wake up each day and say, Jesus, my time, my talent, my treasure is yours? What would happen if you and I, if we would focus in on Jesus' kingdom every day? What would happen if he was all that we wanted? Church, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And if we treasure Jesus more than the things we treasure in this world... It will push that anxiety away. It will push that worry away. And so this morning, I want to challenge you to do that. Allow Jesus to be your treasure. Let him to be the anthem of your heart. Let him be all that you need. And so this morning, I just, I just want to again challenge you. If you haven't, give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. Come to him. Repent return to a relationship with him, believe that he died and rose again, and then follow him. Follow him. And if you know Jesus as Savior and Lord, I want to challenge you and me to seek his kingdom daily. Wake up. This is the day that you have given me, Lord. I'm going to seek your kingdom. I'm going to be your hands and feet. I'm going to love you with all that I am, and I'm going to love others. And where I am wrong, I'm going to ask you to change my heart. I'm going to ask you to make me more like you so that, again, more people around me will know you. Church, we exist here at River of Life Church to help people experience full life as Jesus Christ intended.
Let our treasure be where our heart is. So we're going to make it practical. And as we do so, I'm going to call up the worship team. I promise I will turn on your monitors when I'm done. But as I call you guys up, we're going to make it practical. The first one is sort of like tongue-in-cheek. But, but again, instead of buying those Yeezys, which some of you guys are looking at these days, those Louis Vuitton shirts, those Dior bags, those Nike Jordans, I think what we need to do with our heart's desires, we need to say, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with the money that you have given me? What do you want me to do with the clothing that is on my heart that maybe I desire but I don't actually need because there's something just as good around me? So ask God what you want him to do with, what he wants you to do with your money. Second thing, ask this week, is there someone who in your life who is struggling that you can make a care package for and just go drop it off? I'm not talking about me. I'm doing okay, okay? Yeah, I'm saying, is there someone in your neighborhood or someone downtown that you pass every day as you go to work that you're like, man, I could spare a few bucks and I can make a few packages and drop it off? Or maybe you have a neighbor that's struggling. And so will you, will you say, Jesus, show me how I can love on people around me? Third thing, when worry comes up, when you start worrying about the physical needs, go to our knees. I think we sometimes underestimate what prayer can do and we need to go to our knees and say, God, give me the strength to make it through. And then lastly, be kingdom-minded this week and ask God, what do you want me to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? It's all yours. And so let me, let me just pray with you. Father God, I thank you for today. I pray that today and in the days to come, we will seek your kingdom now and we say, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven as you taught us to pray. And so we pray right now that, that your kingdom will come, your will will be done. That each and every day as, as disciples, as followers of you, we will deny ourselves and say, Jesus, I want to live your way. I want to spread your good news around this world. I want to speak your name into my friends and my family. I want to let your kingdom shine. I don't want to pursue the things of this world. I want to pursue you each and every day. And so where I fall down, because we all fall down, where I mess up, where sin is hidden, I pray that you will make me more like you. Take it away. Jesus, make us more like you today. Help us not to worry. Help us to seek you today and each day to come. And we just pray this, praise this in your name. Amen.